It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Tibbetts Physics. What is crapping in? Today, we are going to talk about optics in our eye, as well as how lenses work, specifically converging lenses or convex lenses. The first thing I like to talk about is we're going to revisit refraction. So we're going to draw a source of light. Let's call it S. And then on the other side, we're going to draw a detector of light. Let's call it D. And we know that light wants to travel the fastest possible path. And that would be straight from S to D. But as we saw from Richard Feynman, light can travel an infinite amount of paths. So it can go up and then down towards the detector or down from the source and up towards the detector. The probability of the upper one and the lower one is the same, so essentially they cancel each other out. And we can do this a ton of times, drawing all the possible paths of light going from the source to the detector. These ones on the right should be reaching the detector. Sorry, I ended them a little bit early. Now, what we could do is we could trick light into saying that all these paths take an equal amount of time, and therefore that the probability should all be equivalent. To do this, all we have to do is insert a lens or a piece of glass. And based on refraction from what we saw, that as light enters a new medium, it's going to slow down. So the light going straight from the source to the detector is going to take a longer time because it's going to travel through the glass the most, but it's also the shortest path. The one going straight up and then straight down is in the glass the least amount of time, so it's going to slow down the least. Same for the one going straight down and then straight. Due to the glass slowing down the light based on the thickness of the glass, all the paths of light are going to take the exact same amount of time. Based on our knowledge of refraction in Snell's Law, we know that the middle line, because it's hitting the lens dead on or at 90 degrees, it's going to travel straight through. And that's also going to slow down. The ones traveling at a greater angle are going to bend the most and also slow down the least. So what happens is based on the thickness of the glass, the amount that the light slows down due to its location, all the paths are going to take the same amount of time to travel from the source to the detector. And we could then focus all the light on one spot at the detector. Imagine you took a magnifying glass, and this is your the sun, the source of light. Here's your magnifying glass. You could focus all the light on a certain point, and then you could cause that, say that point is a heat of paper, a sheet of paper. You can cause that paper to heat up and potentially catch on fire by focusing all the light. We're going to use my hand model to take a lens and focus light at a certain point on a piece of paper and see what happens. Hey everyone, it's Mr. Tibbetts' hand model. How are you? What we're going to do is look at an image created by a lens 
This is like our eyeball. And what we're going to do is form that image on this white piece of paper that's outside. So I'm going to flip the camera around. And what we're going to do is this white paper is our screen. And I'm going to aim this lens outside in front of the camera and watch what happens on this white screen. Notice that the trees are upside down, the sky is on the bottom, and then the deck is on the top of this picture formed by the lens. So as we could see, the image has been inverted and it's upside down. Sorry, it's very difficult to hold this lens with just four fingers. Thanks to my nine-fingered hand model, I hope you were able to see an image that was formed on the piece of paper, and hopefully you're able to notice that that image was inverted. So the sky was on the bottom and the trees were on the top. Now the weird thing is that our eye is just like that glass, glass lens that I was holding. So if physics holds true, that means that our eye also inverts images. So our eyes see things upside down. Which is weird because when we look at things, we don't see things upside down. So what happens is our brain then reinterprets what we're seeing and puts the images right side up. Now the other weird thing, a few other weird things, is one, we don't actually see things. All we're doing is allowing lights of different frequencies to hit our retina on the back of our eyes. And then our nerves then translate that frequency to our brain, which then produces an image that we see. So we don't actually see things, just like how we don't actually touch things or smell things or hear stuff. It's just a figment of our imagination of what our brain is interpreting. Now the other thing about our eyes and how we see things is that when we look at an image, our brain can't interpret that image all at once. So it fills in the blanks and makes up parts of that image for us to see. What's even more interesting is that it takes about one fifth of a second from light to travel from our optic nerve in the back of our eye to our brain and then get interpreted in terms of what we see. So in order for us to operate in real time and not be one, one fifth of a second in the past, our brain then has to predict one fifth of a second in the future. So everything that we see is one fifth of a, one fifth of a second in the future based on what our brain is predicting we're going to see. So not only do we actually not see things, they're just frequencies interpreted by our brain, but we're also looking one fifth of a second into the future, I shouldn't have used air quotes, we're looking one-fifth of a second into the future based on what our brain assumes we're about to see. Anyways, I digress. <clears throat> Let's just quickly look at how our eyes work and then we'll look at um, ray diagrams and more specific lenses. Here we have a pretty crude drawing of an eyeball. Let's just label a few features on it. Features, sorry. The green represents the retina. That's like the screen of where the image is projected on our eye. This little blurb in front of the eye is the cornea. And that acts like a lens, and it's what bends most of the light as it enters our eye. And then the purple is the lens itself. This is what refocuses the light coming in, or focuses the light coming in, so we see a crisper image. It also changes its size to help focus that image. And then in the back is our optical nerve. And that's what sends the signal to our brain for it to interpret what we're seeing. Also, because our retina isn't on the optical nerve, we have a blind spot right here. So if we have light focusing right on our optical nerve, we won't be able to see 
that image. Now some of us wear glasses, maybe we're farsighted or nearsighted. So let's look at what that what causes um, farsightedness and nearsightedness. Let's take an object, this red dot, and we'll put it far away for now. If you're nearsighted, that means you can see objects that are close up fine, but you can't see objects that are farther away. So what happens is the light that's reflecting off of a faraway object as it enters your eye. Let's look at one that's going straight in your eye. So here's one light beam. If you look at another one, it's going to converge as it hits your cornea. And if we look at a bottom light beam, it's also going to converge as it goes through your cornea. And as we can see, what happens for somebody that's nearsighted is that the image is not focused on the retina. It's focused before it reaches the, or sorry, it converges before it reaches the retina. So what we can do with glasses or contacts is add a diverging lens. And what this will do is it'll t allow it to take more time for the light to converge and it'll converge once it hits the retina. So that's if we were nearsighted. If you are farsighted, that means you can see objects that are far away, but you can't see things that are close up very well. So let's draw a near object. So if you're farsighted and we're looking at an object that's um, close to you. Oops. Let's look at the light that's reflected off of that. Probably a bad spot for it, but ignore the optical nerve. And then we'll look at another spot or another point. I'm going to make this a little bit more dramatic. Oops. And then a third um, light ray. Let's fix that one. And what's going to happen for somebody that's far sighted and can't see nearby is that the object converges beyond the retina, so behind it. And you're going to get a blurry image, I would assume. I have 20 20 vision, I think, so I wouldn't know what it's like. So, what we want is the light rays to converge before the retina. So we're going to add a converging lens, which will allow them to converge um, closer to the retina or before they go beyond your retina. So that's what it's like to be either a nearsighted person or a farsighted person. So nearsighted means you can see close up, far away objects converge before the retina. A farsighted person can see objects far away but near objects converge beyond the retina. What we're going to do next are draw ray diagrams to show how objects are formed when light is coming from a source, reflects off of an object, and then enters our eye. We're going to revisit the picture from the past of my hand model looking at the trees outside. Here's our object on the left side of the tree that we're observing. Then in the middle we have our lens. And on the right side, this is the image that was formed. It was inverted upside down. Now at some point we know that light is hitting the tree from the sun or from the sun. And then that light is being reflected off the tree and goes through the lens. So what we're going to draw are called light rays and principal rays. So first of all, the light rays are just rays that are being reflected off of the object. And even though it looks like it's being emitted from the object, we're still talking about it's just being reflected off of it. And we're going to look at specific ones, which are called principal rays, which we'll define in a second. So the first ray we're going to look at is one on the top of the tree. 
it's going straight to the right. Once it gets in the middle of the lens, it's then going to bend down to the top of the tree on the image. Now let's draw the opposite type of light ray. This one's going to go straight down, goes inside the lens, bends due to refraction, and then it's going to travel parallel to the top one to the right. The last type of light ray that we're going to look at is one that's going straight through the lens diagonally and doesn't bend at all because it hits it at a right angle. So these three light rays that are drawn are called the principal rays. And the best way to define the principal rays are just the important light rays. So the important light rays, which means we should probably define what a light ray is. So a light ray is just the direction in which light travels. Um, well, I guess we say light energy travels. And we know that light travels in a straight line. Of course, gravity can bend light as well as different mediums or refraction of light could also bend it, but they're traveling in straight lines. And then we'll lastly define the object is our source of light. Now again, the object is not emitting light, it's just reflecting it off of a light source, but to simplify things, we'll say it's our source of light. So when we're looking at this picture, we're looking at just the top of the tree and three specific light rays called the principal rays going in three directions. And they all converge to the top of the tree on the image side. Now there's gonna be an infinite amount of light rays um, on the top of the tree that will all converge right here. But these three principal rays are the important ones. So if we wanted to, we can draw other rays that are from the top of the tree that are going in at different angles. And they're going to bend once they, oops, sorry, once they go through the lens. Sorry, let me fix that one. It's hard to draw without covering up the camera. Well, assume it's a right angle. Let's draw one more for the sake of completeness. So we can draw an infinite amount of these. But again, we just care about the purple ones, and the purple ones are the principal rays. Now we can also look at different spots of the tree because light is emitting from or reflecting off the tree in all locations. So we would get an entire image if we looked at all spots of the tree and where they're focusing in, focusing on the right side of the image. But we could get the gist of the height of the tree on both sides, which is sufficient information to help us analyze these problems. We're now going to look at ray diagrams in the physics of lenses. On the left side, we have our object, and it has some measurable height we can label H. Of course, in the middle, we have the lens, and then the black line represents our principal axis. Our principal axis goes in the middle, goes through the middle of the lens, as well as what the object is resting on. Let's draw our three principal rays using the top of the arrow. So our first one is going to go straight across and then bend downwards once it goes into the lens. 
Our second one will do the opposite. Goes straight down and then goes parallel to the principal axis. Oops. And then our third one is one that goes straight through the lens without bending at all. Hmm, came out pretty good. And as we could see, the objects, or sorry, the light rays all converge right here. So I'm going to extend the principal axis out a little bit. And we're going to just complete our arrow. We'll draw it green this time. It's going to be inverted. And we'll call this our image, which can be lowercase i. And then we have a height, we'll call it h prime. Notice that the light rays, once they, after they converge, they're now going to diverge beyond it. But we just care about the point of convergence. Now the other parts of the principal axis in lenses that we have are called the focus. So the focus, we'll label them first and I'll explain in a second. It's where the principal rays intersect the principal axis. So we have one on the right side of the lens and one on the left side of the lens. And they should be at the same locations. And we can label these as lowercase f. Now this is determined by if we took parallel rays don't draw this. If we took parallel rays, rays sorry, coming in from the left, what would happen is that these three rays, once they go through the lens, are all going to converge at this focal point. So that's how we get the focus. Sorry, let me see, erase this yellow, whoops. I'm gonna pause, then erase these. Okay, really quick, why don't we define the focus? So the focus is the point, or sorry, the image that corresponds To the convergence of light and we should say or we could say parallel light from an in infinite distance and then we can also add to this this is where the principal rays intersect with the principal axis. Okay, we also care about, or, well, I guess we could say care about, what's called the focal length. The focal length is from the focus to the middle of the lens. So that's the focal length. And we're going to label, sorry I messed up, we're going to label the focal length as f, not the focus. So just the focal length is f. And then of course we also have it on the other side, um, from the right focus to the middle of the lens, also called F, the focal length. Okay, so we have a few more things we want to label. We have the object's distance, so the distance from where the object is to the middle of the lens. So object distance. And we're going to label that as lowercase p. And then on the other side, we have the image distance. Let's find a different color. So that's from the image again to the middle of the lens. And 
and that is called Q, lowercase q. Before we come up with a formula and do a couple of practice problems, let's look at a simulation of an object in a lens. So on the left side, we have an arrow, that's our object. In the middle, we see our lens. And on the right side, an inverted is our image. So what we could do is we'll take our object. Let's move it farther away to the left and watch what happens to the image. As we could see, as it moves farther away, the rays on the right side converge sooner, which means that image will be closer to the lens, but we're also getting a smaller image. As we move it back to its normal position, right here should be about the same size. This location of the object is two focal lengths away. So here's the focus, the X to the lens, and we just double the two to get two focus or foci away. Now we're going to move it closer to the lens. And as we can see, the object is getting farther away, but it's also increasing in size. And once we get it right on the focus, all of a sudden it disappears. So let me see if I could change the index of refraction. I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. But we can see that once it's at the focus, it disappears. And now if we get even closer to the lens, what's going to happen now is that the light rays on the right side of the lens don't converge. They end up diverging. But if we work our way backwards, they converge to the left of the lens. And now we have a virtual image that's also increased in size. Notice this virtual image is not inverted, so it's facing in the same direction, and it's on the left side of the lens. All right, so let's just um, do a for write down the formula and do a few practice problems together. The formula that we're going to use for lenses is 1 over f, that's the focal length, is equal to 1 over p, that's the object's distance, plus 1 over q, that's the image's distance. So why don't we define those just in case your picture above looks a little bit messy. So f is the focal length, p is the object's distance, And we can say from the lens. Now, the point of reference that we're using for the object's distance from the lens is the focus. So if the object is to the left of the focus, P is going to be positive. But if we take our object and move it to the right of the focus, P is going to be negative. So let's say that this is positive when it's to the left of, we'll call it the first focus. So positive when left of uh, first focus, that'd be anything from the first focus into the left. And then it's negative when it's to the right of first focus. So if it's in between the focus and the lens, then we have a negative for our object's distance. And then Q, that equals the image's distance. And again, from the lens. This is going to be the opposite. It's positive 
when it's to the right of the second focus. So anywhere to the right of the focus beyond the lens gives us a positive Q. And it's negative when it's to the left of the second focus. So anywhere to the left of the focus will give us a negative Q. As we saw from the simulation on FET, we can add a couple more things. We say that when the object is in front of the focus and lens, that means it's to the left of the focus, we got a real and inverted image. So we get a real and inverted image. And then the opposite, when the object was behind or beyond, So an object, I guess we could say, is between the focus and lens. It created a image that was virtual, meaning a non-real image. So it's virtual and um, upright, so it's not inverted. Okay, now the other thing that we can calculate is the magnification of the image. So how much does it grow or shrink? So magnification. Let's call that capital M. And that's equal to h prime, the image height, over h, the object's height. Or we can calculate it based on the distances away from the lens. So it's negative the image distance over p, the object's distance from the lens. The reason why it's negative is because if we get a real image, it's going to be inverted. So that negative just signifies that it's upside down or inverted. Let's do number one together from your practice problems. Number one says a converging lens of focal length 10 centimeters forms an image of an object that is situated various distances. If the object is placed 30 centimeters from the lens, first draw and label a ray diagram then determine the, the location of the image. Is the image real or virtual? Determine its magnification. And then repeat when the object is 10 centimeters away and 5 centimeters away from the lens. So let's set up our picture for letter A when the object is 30 centimeters away from the lens. So here's our object. The distance away from the lens, we can label P, and that's 30 centimeters. We do not have to convert to meters for this unit. Let's draw our principal rays. So we have our top one, our bottom one, and then a one that goes straight through. And the focal length, or focal point, is first where the principal rays intersect the principal axis. And then the focal length, we're told for this lens, is 10 centimeters. So we say F is 10 centimeters. So the first thing we want to find for letter A is the location of the image, which is Q. How far away is it from the lens? 
So let's start with our formula that we have. 1 over f equals 1 over p plus 1 over q. We'll isolate q, so we'll subtract 1 over p from both sides. So 1 over q is 1 over f minus 1 over p. Now what we want to do next is look at the sign for p. It's to the left of the focus, so p is going to remain positive. So we get 1 over q is 1 over 10 centimeters minus 1 over 30 centimeters. And we get 1 over q ends up equaling 1 over 15 centimeters. Take the inverse of that, q is equal to 15 centimeters. Because the object is to the left of the focus, we're going to get a real image. Or sorry, yeah, a real image. And as we can see from the picture, it's inverted, but that doesn't that's not a question. And then the last part is determine its magnification. So we don't know the heights, which means we have to use the other formula, negative q over p. I'll just plug and chug. Negative 15 centimeters over 30 centimeters gives us 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 centimeters. So the size decreased by half and it's inverted. Letter B says say that says do the same thing, except this time P is 10 centimeters away. So we have 1 over F equals 1 over P plus 1 over Q. We get 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F minus 1 over P. 1 over Q, 1 over 10 centimeters minus 1 over 10 centimeters. So 1 over q gives us 0 centimeters. We take the inverse of that, which gives us q to equal infinite centimeters. And that means that when the focus and the image, or sorry, when the focus and the object are at the same location, we get an infinitely sized image. Um, so is it real or inverted? Well, it's inf or real or virtual, it's, we could say it's infinite. And to calculate its magnification, we're just going to get um, negative q over p, which gives us negative infinity over 10 centimeters, which gives us negative infinity. All right, moving on. Negative, or letter C, same thing, except again when the object is five centimeters away. I'll just give you the answers. You could do the work if you want for extra practice. So we get the image distance to be negative 10 centimeters. Negative 10 centimeters means that it's located on the left side of the lens, 10 centimeters away from it, right on the left side of the focus. So because it's on the left side of the lens, that means that we get a virtual image. And then lastly, we can calculate its magnification negative q over p, 10 centimeters, and p was 5 centimeters. We have two negatives, so that gives us a positive, and that gives us 2. So it's 2 times larger, but it's a virtual image on the other side of the lens. For problem number 2, we have two lenses this time. So the question says, Two converging lenses are placed 20 centimeters apart with an object 30 centimeters in front of lens one on the left. 
Part A. If lens 1 has a focal length of 10 cm, draw and label a ray diagram, locate the image formed by lens 1, and determine its magnification m sub 1. When we get a problem like this with two lenses, we want to um, simplify it by just analyzing the first lens first and ignore the second one, which will be our purple one. So let's draw a ray diagram first for the object going through lens one. Hopefully they all converge. Sweet. And then we'll draw the image formed by that lens. So we'll just label this I for now. So far, the important information that we have is that the lenses are 20 centimeters apart. We'll use that for part two. And we know that the focal length of lens one is 10 centimeters. So from the focus to the middle of the lens, let's call it F sub one is 10 centimeters. Okay, so for letter A, we've got our ray diagram drawn. Oh, sorry. Yeah, for letter A, part two, locate the image formed by lens one. We also know, I forgot to label this, that the distance from the object to the lens, we'll call it P sub one, is 30 centimeters. So to calculate Q, the image distance, we have to do 1 over F is equal to 1 over P plus 1 over Q. That gives us 1 over Q is 1 over P minus 1 over F. Or sorry, 1 over F minus 1 over P. So 1 over Q is equal to 1 over 10 centimeters minus 1 over 30 centimeters. And from the previous question, we get the same numbers. Q equals 15 centimeters. Um, so I forgot to label these sub ones. So Q, the image, is 15 centimeters to the right of the lens. So Q1, 15 centimeters. Now that we know Q1, Let's calculate the magnification of the image formed by P1, or the object. So M1 is negative Q1 over P1, which gives us negative 15 centimeters over 30 centimeters, which gives us negative 0.5. So it shrunk by a half, and it's inverted. So the image should be smaller, but it's not, but that's okay, it's not drawn to scale but we can see that it's inverted. Now, the image formed by the object, when we look at the second lens, is now going to be the object for the second lens. So I1 is now O2. Part two or part B says, if lens two on the right has a focal length of 20 centimeters, Use your result from part A to locate the image formed, determine its magnification, and determine the final magnification of M12. So the first thing we want to do is let's label the focal length of lens 2, and that we're told is 20 centimeters. So F2 is 20 centimeters which means we want to find what P2 is. Um, P2, the distance from where the object is to lens, the lens, lens 2. And we know that the focal length is 20 centimeters, which means P2 has to be 20 centimeters minus 15 centimeters, Q1, because it's 15 centimeters away from lens 1, so P2 is going to be 5 centimeters. 
Now I misspoke earlier, so we're going to change a few things in our notes. Sorry about that. Let's say um, for P, it's positive when it's to the left of the first lens, not focus, and negative when it's to the right of the lens. So this means that when it's to the left of it, it's in front. When it's um, to the right of it, it's behind. And then same thing for the image. It's positive when it's to the right of the lens or behind it. And it's negative when it's to the left of the lens or in front of it. So not the focus, the lens is what we're um, concerned about. So if we go back to our problem, object two, if we're looking at the second lens, it's in front of it or to the left. So it's going to be five, positive five centimeters. Okay, so let's calculate where the image is formed from object two, which is the image formed from object one. So we're going to start with one over F sub two is equal to one over P two plus one over Q two. That gives us one over Q two is one over F two minus one over P two. So one over Q two is um, one over 20 centimeters minus one over five centimeters. Plug and chug and we get Q2 to equal negative 6.67 centimeters. Q2 is the image's distance. In this case, it's negative. So it's going to be to the left of the lens, the second lens. So I'm going to draw it higher up so we could see it. So from the lens, a little bit beyond its first location is Q2, negative 6.67 centimeters. And we want to determine its magnification. That'll tell us whether or not it's inverted. M2 equals negative Q2 over P2, negative 6.67 centimeters. But we have to make it a double negative since it's, the number itself is already negative. So that's going to go to positive over P2, which was uh, 5 centimeters. Plug and chug, and we get 1.33. So now it increases by 1.33 times its size. Notice that the magnification is positive 1.33, but it's positive relative to the already inverted image, which means that it should still be inverted. And we can determine that by looking at the total magnification, M12. That's the magnification of the image as it goes through lens 1 and then lens 2. To calculate that, all we have to do is M1 times M2. So that gives us negative 0 0.5 times positive 1.33. And we get a net magnification of negative 0. 665. And here we can see that the image is inverted and it's almost half the size of the original. So here would be I2. And that's it for this video. I know it's long, but thanks for your patience and thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. See ya!